and some other spaces that are incubators and some other approaches. Um, and finally, we emphasize metrics uh, and measurements of success beyond growth and profit, beyond the financial metrics that are literally the main uh, indicators for some incubator spaces, including the Columbia Startup Lab. And so we're very deliberate about that, and we know that you know, from our work uptown at Columbia GSAP, that there's a lot of ways to make architecture. There are a lot of goals of architecture beyond just uh, making buildings in the most efficient way possible. Um, and we're kind of engaging that in various ways, and our, our members are engaging that. Um, so this is um, a space that's a, an open experiment. Um, you know, this is our third year. We've been changing it every year. We've been learning from the past years. And in a kind of true GSAP spirit, we're exploring these ideas, prototyping them, debating them, extrapolating out from them to new definitions of architecture, and kind of learning and adapting and adjusting along the way. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce uh, the speakers that we have for the event, who will talk a little bit more about what they're doing in and around the GSAP incubator, related to some of the topics that were included in the title of the event, um, such as entrepreneurship, new modes of practice, research, architecture, culture, the city. Um, so I'm going to introduce all of the speakers in a row right now, and then um, they'll come up and each present uh, briefly, and that will be followed by a panel discussion. So our speakers include Karen Wong, Deputy Director of the New Museum and Mastermind of New Me, uh, also adjunct professor here at GSAP. Uh, Tay Carpenter is founder and principal of Agency Agency and adjunct assistant professor here at GSAP. Dominic Leong, who's a, a graduate of GSAP, uh, so in the spirit of GSAP being, or the GSAP incubator being about graduate projects. Um, Dominic uh, graduated in 2003 from AD, founding partner of Leong Leong, and adjunct assistant professor here at GSAP. Um, Liz McEnany um, graduated in 2004 from the Historic Preservation uh, Program. She's executive director of the SS Columbia Project. Alejandra Navarrete uh, graduated in 2011 from AOD, principal at NAMI Studio and visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute. Lauren Johnson and Ryan Day graduates in 2016 from the MR program, are co founders of QSpace. And finally, Vika Rebeck uh, graduated in 2015 from CCCP. Um, and uh, leads the studio Sabila Soon and is adjunct assistant professor at GSAP. So uh, we'll hear each of the presenters in roughly that order, and then we'll all kind of have a, a discussion about some of the issues that are raised in the presentations. So uh, with that, I think Karen will be here. I'm super excited to be here, particularly um, uptown. I think um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, what great energy there is downtown, but I did want to thank um, Columbia GSAP, as well as my students, for making um, my every Friday uh, just so invigorating, and it's certainly uh, given me a new kind of energy uh, for my professional life. Um, so where I'd like to start here is when we ever talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, it's hard not to go to Silicon Valley and look at this organogram of um, Google, which is, of course, um, Alphabet being the uh, holding company of all these different initiatives. And then I'd like to kind of frame New Museum up in the same way, um, but of course we, uh, we're quite tiny. Um, but, uh, but again, we have this kind of idea in terms of what is a 21st century model of a museum, and can you work outside of your uh, white wall spaces? And of course for us the answer is truly yes. And so we have uh, a number of different uh, platforms, and I'll speak specifically about New Inc. Uh, today. So um, one of the key things um, that uh, when we started to research about five, six years ago uh, was this idea of the number of freelance workers uh, that will uh, evolve by 2020 um, and the type of spaces uh, that these freelancers will want to be working in. Um, in accordance with that is also this um, 2012 report from the Center for Urban Futures where essentially New York City graduates twice as many artists and design graduates than any other city. 56% of them have plans to start their own businesses. 
and yet there is really no infrastructure in New York City uh, to uh, be able to um, complement, you know, of course, the, the amazing uh, education you can find here in New York. Uh, in 2012-2013, when we were serving the city, uh, we noticed that there seemed to be incubators and workspaces uh, from tech to business to fashion to food to science, biotech. It was everything except for artists and designers, and we thought, hmm, maybe there's a gap here, and uh, would it be interesting for a museum to experiment with the idea of a workspace uh, that was also very much about a community? And so this is where we feel we live, uh, kind of at the intersection of artist residencies, co-working spaces, tech incubators, university media labs. Um, so quickly by the numbers, we've uh, been four years in operation, uh, our formula currently is about 40 full time, meaning that people spend a year with us. Um, uh, there's about 60 who are part time. Uh, the key thing to understand here is that as a museum, we're very interested in developing a model that is self sustained. So, meaning that um, as an operation, um, uh, the fees are paid by the membership um, basically pays for the operating budget of this platform. Um, the female to male ratio in uh, uh, oh, this is, um, this is a mistake. Uh, our female to male re relationship in year one was 30 70. We have very specifically tried to create an environment which is reflective of New York City demographics. So by year three, we were at 50 50. We're at year four, we, are, we remain at 50 50. We are also 45% non white. Um, we've incubated more than 100 projects. And more than $10 million has been raised. But the key thing to understand here is we're much more interested about cultural impact, social impact, radical ideas, rather than um, how financially successful you are, which is exactly what David was talking about um, for the GSAP incubator. So this is the space. Um, and obviously, since we are in an architectural school, this was done by Soil, Florian Eidenberg, and Jane Liu. Um, we had a tiny budget, most of it was spent on um, infrastructure, which included um, uh, fire, um, yeah, fire scale where, well, as well as making an elevator um, that was going to be used for more than um, two or three people at a time. Um, and so, um, and I, I'm embarrassed by these pictures. Um, these particular architects don't really like people in their pictures, so <laughs> very clean spaces. It's, it's super messy now. Um, but I wanted to, um, I think, really, um, given the short amount of time, I think the best way to really talk about uh, New Inc. is really the type of members we attract. So it's an application process, um, as well as an interview process. It's highly curated, meaning that we are really looking for um, an interdisciplinary group of folks who we think ultimately not only will be lifelong friends, but who will end up collaborating. Um, uh, in year three, we, um, we have the group DIS, um, an artist collective well known for curating the, um, uh, the Art uh, Berlin uh, Biennial a couple of years ago. And they came to New Inc. specifically with the idea of could they develop an alternative model for an art school. Um, in this case, we have Stephanie Dinkins. Um, she brought a project which she had been working on for a couple of years. If you guys are interested in AI, that's Dina48. She's the first um, uh, robot and she happens to be uh, female and black. But her interrogation, which is to have a number of conversations with Dina48 over the last several years, was to decide um, and understand a black female identity that was engineered by white architects. Uh, since um, being at New Inc., she's really become a thought leader um, in the field of um, AI and race. And so we're, we're particularly proud of her in terms of her metric of success is uh, now really kind of traveling the world in conferences and speaking about her work. Um, we also um, had Frances uh, Swan, um, who is a uh, data visualization um, artist and scientist. And, um, and this is probably one of the success stories that came out of year three. Uh, this was a scientist and an advertising person who came together and they were really interested in democratizing the idea of museums. I think we all can still pretty much agree that uh, museum spaces do tend to be elitist. And what they were interested in was could they make a museum in the shape of a kiosk 
that would then um, be distributed at DMVs, hospital, restrooms, libraries, airports. And um, they came to us uh, pretty much with this built prototype, and what they really wanted to look at was, you know, should they become a nonprofit? Should they become a business? Uh, what kind of distribution systems should they uh, work with? Um, and they ended up going the nonprofit route. And within three months, they got their first grant for $300,000. They since have raised $1.5 million. They now employ, I think, about uh, a dozen folks. So um, it's really exciting. What they plan to do is essentially create new exhibitions every six months. And it's done as a subscription model. So essentially, if you're a hospital that's called yourself Kings, uh, Kings County Hospital, you would buy a subscription for the year, and then these would be delivered, and then they would be turned out um, with a second exhibition in three to six months' time. Um, another character is um, Jonathan Bobrow uh, from the MIT Media Lab. He worked a lot with um, hardware and software um, games. <coughs> And um, in, in, in one of the ways that, again, how we like to connect uh, New Inc. back to the museum, besides the museum providing um, space and programming and uh, professional development, is um, he has developed a, a new um, kind of Lego-like origami um, game, which he uh, was able to uh, finance on Kickstarter. And we will premiere it at the New Museum Store during the holiday season. Um, this is probably one of my favorite projects, which is um, called Elia, um, Life as Technology. Uh, his grandmother uh, was blind. His mother, a graphic designer, developed a new type of braille that was not based on the DOT system, which apparently takes about a year, year and a half to learn. Um, this system, based on pictograms, takes about two days to learn. So essentially, um, about the uh, about only two percent of those who are impaired visibly actually have learned Braille, and they really hope to revolutionize the idea of um, hand those who are visually impaired, as well as the friends and family of those who are visually impaired, to be able to learn this language together. So he's now developed the printer, and he uh, remains at New for a second year to really now look at uh, distribution. And then um, one of the key things that um, New Inc. does is really try to uh, partner with other brands and organizations to make sure the work kind of gets out into the world. Um, this is New Inc. at South by Southwest, where I think we've uh, been down there every year since uh, we have, um, have launched. Um, we've also worked with Red Bull Arts, where um, a number of our um, experiential installations uh, were demonstrated in an exhibition-like format um, about uh, a few years ago. Uh, we worked with Microsoft Connect, where they chose a team of um, engineers, sound designers, architects from our cool court in, I believe, year one, and worked with the musician Matthew Deere to create this installation, uh, which we demoed for a weekend. Um, and then um, uh, most recently, uh, we're working with Bell Labs, where uh, three of our new Inc. members are in residence there working with engineers to essentially uh, beta um, an idea that they have. And then subsequently, actually, all three of the artists were commissioned to then take it to the next level and bring it to a pre presentation uh, situation. Um, what's, what's super exciting as well is um, the Knight Foundation gave us a major grant to develop a museum uh, track. And uh, I say this um, to segue into GSAP Incubator because um, one of the GSAP Incubator members, um, Vika, applied for the museum uh, tech track and was accepted. So she um, went from GSAP Incubator to New Inc., which was really just another way to hang out in our space for a couple of years. But what's really nice is that she is, so she has received a fellowship, and um, I'm super excited about the uh, particular project she is developing specifically um, at this notion of um, the Knight Foundation, again, believes that technology is going to be critical within the museum environment, but only the wealthiest of museums have really been able to figure <coughs> 
figure out how to use technology, like a MoMA, like, like a Met, uh, who can afford 100 people in the digital department. What they want to do is, can folks at New Inc. Um, start to develop um, platforms, projects, um, hardware, software that could democratize the museum landscape and essentially smaller regional museums could apply these types of technologies um, to their um, working life. Um, so that's a quick snapshot of New Inc. and I'll now turn it over to, I guess it's... Um, um, Tay. Tay. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Tay Carpenter and I teach uh, the Core 1 sequence and also in the Advanced 4 sequence here, Scales and Environment, which is coordinated by David. And I'm also a director of the Waste Initiative here, which is a new um, applied research platform um, that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and David asked uh, both Dominic and myself to talk a little bit about how we started our practices um, and about, let's say, alternative modes of practice and how we work today. Um, and my practice um, honestly started by accident. Um, I had always had a vision of starting a practice at some vague point in the future um, when I was ready, um, but of course that never really happens. Um, so at the time when I started my practice, I was um, on a Wordland Fellowship at Rice University, um, which is a research and teaching fellowship um, in Houston, and in the summer of 2014 I was approached by a friend uh, who was involved with a nonprofit organization called Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, and which is a mentor organization between um, children at risk and then um, putting together lifelong like, mentorship relationships. Um, he asked if I'd be interested in putting together a concept design for their new 20,000 square foot um, headquarters in downtown Houston where they just purchased the land. And I was under the impression the entire time that this was for fundraising and that this was more of an ideas project um, and that they just needed some images for a, a possible project. Um, so I walked, worked on the project that summer, I hired two students and presented them with a concept design that they were really happy with and I sort of thought that was the end of the story. Um, but then I got a call a couple weeks later saying we need construction documents immediately and we want to get started on the project as soon as possible. Um, so this is the project. Um, this is from about a year ago. This is the back of the building and it's in a pretty visible location along the I-10 freeway looking back towards downtown Houston. You can see Philip Johnson's Penzoil place um, in the background. Um, but I talk about this because, as you can imagine, there was an enormous amount of growing pains in starting a project um, in that capacity. Um, and so within about two months, I had to set up a website, get business cards, form a limited liability corporation, um, and really establish a <coughs> platform for uh, my practice to do this project. Um, and this is just one interior of the project, and it's uh, recently completed. Um, it'll be opening in uh, January of 2018. Um, we just went down to photograph right before the hurricane, actually. Um, and I think in the spirit of um, uh, practice and starting new practices, this project, you know, more or less happened on a couple laptops in my garage apartment in Houston. Um, uh, and it was really the momentum, let's say, for starting my own practice. Um, and I, I think I probably could have used some incubation <laughs> um, at the moment. Um, and so a garage apartment is obviously very different in Houston than what it is in New York City. Um, so I have a studio um, in uh, Williamsburg, right by McCarran Park. Um, this is Columbia and my studio. Um, and we work with a bunch of interesting people in our building. It's about five stories. Um, and you know, on my floor, for example, there's fashion designers for humans, fashion designers for dogs. There's a coffee roaster and acupuncturist, um, which all is sort of like a bad for a joke. But I actually find it incredibly nourishing and liberating to be working around people who do things that are incredibly different from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, in addition to the project in Texas, uh, my practice also operates between writing and research and speculative design. And we really engage with contemporary environmental conditions <coughs> through explorations of new materialities and new subjectivities. Um, and these are just three quick examples of projects that we've been working on recently. Um, in which we're exploring an aesthetics of accumulation that looks towards geology and large time scales and hybrid forms of representation. Um, so this is a winning design for an island that's formed in the North Pacific subtropical gyre, which is also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The idea is that it's co-produced between nature and human waste and produces um, its own species and ecosystems. Um, on the bottom is a souvenir for the current exhibition at Storefront for Art and Architecture. Um, which is a bi-directional core sample for Sunset Park, which reads both the past and the future through its material stratification. Um, and then the last project on the top is um, a project with a time scale from now until 10,000 years. And it's basically a test bed design for climate engineered carbon sequestration strategies. Um, and this is just, you know, in five minutes in the talk, uh, this is just sort of an example of what we do, but the work we do in the practice really hopes to expand 
um, an environmental imagination and an awareness about our own entanglements with the world. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, the work of the practice is, of course, tightly linked with teaching and my research here at GSAP. And the Waste Initiative is an applied research platform that um, is just really recently launched, um, which explores the possibilities for the role of waste uh, in relationship to architecture and the city. And we're interested in rethinking waste and disposability in terms of its value proposition um, and also the potential resource. And so the plan for the initiative is to operate between design studios, seminars, summer workshops, um, and also to really develop continuous longer term projects on campus uh, through prototypes and physical design speculations um, in the real world. And I think what differentiates um, the Waste Initiative work from my own practice is it is it's tied to academia and to Columbia as an institution, much like uh, the, you know, the incubator is. And I think that then provides a platform to collaborate um, across departments with experts in anthropology, for me, for experts in anthropology, environmental engineering, uh, the Earth Institute, and then also for work to unfold at a larger scale. So, thank you. Uh, I'm Don McNaught. I don't have a presentation. I thought I'd try to just, like, explain it. Uh, um, so yeah, I'm partner at Leon Leon with my brother Chris, and we have a small office that's about 10 people. We're on the Bowery River, like two blocks uh, south of the museum. And I think, yeah, the trajectory is essentially graduated here, went, went to work for Bernard for like Bernard Chimney for five years, and then was kind of moonlighting, um, doing competitions and stuff on the side. And eventually that sort of turned into like a couple of real projects. And, I was uh, for a fashion designer, flagship store, and also a townhouse. And I think at the time, it was sort of like right when the economy tanked in 2009. And we were sort of in this strange predicament where we had this opportunity to work on a global scale with this fashion company that was scaling in spite of the kind of economic downturn. Um, so from the very beginning, our practice was very much based in New York and also very global. So we sort of formed a lot of our concept of practice around this kind of you know, global, global kind of mentality. So we're doing these projects in Asia, and we're also doing a lot of experimentation within the neighborhood of Lower East Side, actually doing a lot of self-initiated projects and galleries and really building projects ourselves. So we, I think our, our mode of practice was really um, a, a kind of product of circumstance and opportunity as much as it was about an idealized concept of what we think architecture should do. And I think what we've learned is that um, in spite, like every, every generation, every individual, every practice um, is very unique to its time uh, in kind of economic context, a cultural context, geographic, and that even though we have inspirations for, for different practices that we look back over in history, that it's really, we've learned really important to, at a certain point, let like, like go of that and just sort of embrace where, where you're at in the world in a particular moment. Um, because that is, in a way, the only way to actually develop, I think, agency or relevant ideas. So we have always thought of, um, I guess there's three diagrams that describe our practice. One is this kind of like feedback loop where you have uh, disciplinary issues, uh, obsessions, like the history of ideas that you kind of uh, are indoctrinated with or inherit when you go to architecture school that in a way also becomes your own baggage. Uh, and then you have then we have like professional issues which are um, issues related to actually practicing in the world um, and things like control precision how do you deal with technology how do you make your business function from an economic point of view sustainability over the long term and then we always think of a kind of larger cultural social context and um, that has to do with ideas that are not necessarily perceived as architectural but uh, uh, kind of issues that we think are uh, integral to how you understand the world and to try to figure out how, how architectural thinking can engage those. So, uh, for example, working on the largest LGBT center in the world, um, so issues of like sexuality and gender, um, how does that start to fold into, how does architectural thinking relate to that, for example? And so it's really this kind of constant feedback loop in our mind between these three poles, and um, I think it's a, we kind of started off our practice uh, intentionally not doing speculative work. We said we don't, want to, we don't want to do kind of competition, we want to do things that have some kind of engagement. So the idea of engagement is somehow a filter to decide what kind of what ideas are relevant. And it's, it kind of filters some of those things quickly. Um, and the other diagram, okay, the, the second diagram is essentially this idea that um, if you look at like kind of X, Y, Z, or X, X and Y axes, you have um, 
time on the bottom axis and sort of complexity and uh, kind of productivity on this axis. And the kind of technological environment we're in with kind of Moore's law and network effects, which produces kind of exponential acceleration of, of, of change. And then you have um, kind of human evolution, which is sort of this very subtle kind of, I don't even know, it's, it's, it's geologic time. <laughs> And then, so you have this, this huge kind of dissonance or chasm between how we evolve human beings versus the kind of increasing complexity of the world. And then architecture is somehow just above human evolution, but just, just kind of goes like this. And so this is kind of like, I think, an increasingly kind of contemporary phenomena and something that as, as an architect or an architectural practice, it becomes very challenging in a way to be able to operate in like with the kind of with agility, speed, and to be able to kind of accelerate with the rest of the world. As everyone knows architecture is an inherently slow kind of process. So which leads to the third diagram, which is essentially, traditionally architects, you can think of it as a two by two. So you have, we design things and then we figure out how to realize them. So that's kind of documentation and going through the construction process. And this is, you could say this is sort of like the inherent fundamental uh, service or practice of architecture. And that's the slow, that's the slow one. And then we're in, interested in this kind of other axes. And I think in a way, like every, every I would say like, to, to sort of operate at uh, this kind of fast and slow pace, this other axes is like the fast axes. So right now we think of it as like strategy and uh, kind of experience. And I think um, we kind of navigate between these two poles and try to switch speeds and, and constantly try to find ways of shifting our practice to actually have uh, modes of engagement that are, are relevant for contemporary culture. So examples of that are doing things like exhibition design, but also um, do, in, a, in a way that's similar to um, uh, the incubator is that this, this component of critique and research, which um, oftentimes is not a kind of part of typical architectural scope. That, that that kind of deep thinking also actually allows us to, to kind of accelerate in certain, in certain situations because there's already a kind of critical position to relate to the world. So that kind of starts to rotate into this other axis. So we're, we're kind of trying to get into projects sooner, try to actually uh, use the agility of thinking as a way to engage the world even before you make anything. So because uh, production is always quite slow. So how do you start to actually use our kind of critical capacity as an expectation of what kind of architectural practice has to offer as a general um, service for, for lack of better word. Um, I mean, the current projects we're working on range from doing furniture, uh, small scale objects, artifacts, all the way up to the scale of the city. Um, and we're doing the largest of the decamps uh, in the United States, Hollywood, um, some mixed use projects in, in Flushing, Queens, and uh, a hotel in San Francisco, a retail project. Anyway, the point is, I think the other thing we're interested in is, is kind of uh, the new, kind of the what leads to new typologies. And if you kind of think about the value of space uh, today as opposed to 20 years ago before the internet, um, when in this case, now the, the primary medium of organizing people, information, and power is, is not space and it has ceased to be for a long time. So, a lot of these kind of collectivities and actions that happen in these other mediums at a certain point, not always, but they, they come back to space. So, you can look at this from, from like retail projects, you can also look at it from, from the recent protests in Charlottesville. Um, but there's a different value of space today, and so I think that necessitates. Um, a lot of investigation into new typologies, and, and um, we're kind of fascinated in how social organization translates into new typologies. Great. Uh, hi, it's great to be here. I'm Liz McNamee. Um, as David mentioned, I'm a graduate of the Historic Preservation <coughs> Program in 2002. Uh, I've, my career has kind of ranged since graduating from Columbia. I've had the privilege of coming back uh, as both an adjunct professor in the Urban Design Program and the Preservation Program. And I now teach uh, at NYU Tandon School of Engineering uh, in the Integrated Digital Media and the Sustainable Urban Environments Program. Um, this is just a, some photos of some of the projects that I've worked on. 
I uh, spent about three years working in northern India doing site interpretation plans. Uh, I received a grant grant to document the architecture of Maputo, Mozambique. I have worked closer to home, um, curating an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York on a history of uh, land use on Staten Island. Uh, and even more recently, the landscape that I've come to love is the Hudson Valley. And it's that landscape that I'm going to talk about today. So uh, in 2009, I first started working on Hudson Valley projects. And uh, for those of you who might remember, this momentous event might have passed you by. 2009 was the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson's discovery, uh, in quotes, of the Hudson River. Uh, and this was supposed to be a year of massive celebrations. The state had put aside money to give to cities and towns, so there were going to be parades and fireworks celebrations. Uh, but if you remember in 2009, that's when the economy collapsed. So instead of having a year-long celebration, a lot of these towns, there are very angry people there, who didn't want to talk about the past, they didn't want to celebrate the past, they wanted to talk about what was happening at that very moment. Um, so with some collaborators, uh, we received funding from the Hudson River Foundation and the J.M. Kaplan Fund, and we rented this historic barge, a 1930s railroad barge, uh, and in the spirit of Obama's whistle stop campaign, we took the barge from Albany uh, to points south all the way to New York City. And we stopped along the way uh, and we brought together kind of heads of various organizations, civic activists, and we had a conversation about what was happening at that moment. And from this conversation, uh, we developed a series of white topics on uh, ranging from uh, food to education to economic development. But the reality is that uh, very few people read white papers. So while we thought we were putting forth this resource that people would have to actually uh, plot the path of the Hudson Valley in the future, we realized that we weren't reaching our target audience, which were you know, everyday people living in the valley. So we took another shot at it, and we made a documentary film. And the film is called Hudson Rising. We've screened it here at Columbia. Uh, in the past as part of the urban design program. Um, what was supposed to be a three-month, 10-minute film turned into a three-year, 56-minute film uh, where every, I did everything from walking up Olana. As the producer of the film, you have a lot of downtime so you were put into action. Uh, talking to people at a hip-hop festival in Newburgh and walking into lots of restaurants. Um, we ended up having well over 56 minutes of footage. I think we had something about 250 hours worth of footage. And there came this moment in time where we were lost and we couldn't figure out how to tie the narrative of this um, film together. And the film really was supposed to be about urban planning issues, the relationship between open space and the cities and agriculture. Um, so at some point in the past, I'd heard about this project to bring a steamboat to the Hudson River. And at that moment of desperation, when I thought, how do we tie this narrative together, it dawned on me that it's all about the Hudson, and it's about the connectivity. Each Hudson River city and town was so connected to the waterfront, the cities and towns were all connected to each other, and they all had such a connection to New York City. So I bought a plane ticket to Detroit, which is where this alleged soon-to-be Hudson River boat was, and I found the SS Columbia. Uh, this is uh, on the, the roof in front of the wheelhouse with our director on that very first visit. Um, the boat ended up not making the final cut in the film, I'll say, but uh, it, I just couldn't, I couldn't forget about this project. Um, so the founder of the organization uh, actually passed away shortly after our visit, and the future of the boat was kind of up in the air. And it was one day I woke up and realized I'd probably spent about 80 hours that week thinking about the boat, working on the boat, working on the boat having nightmares about shipwrecks, and I realized I was sunk, and uh, this was the project that I had to work on. So I'm going to introduce you to the SS Columbia project. This is the boat. It's a 115-year-old steamboat, about 30,000 square feet of usable space. Uh, I'll talk to you through it a bit more. So, for those of you who might know, for 150 years, there was this incredible history of these day excursion boats that would leave New York City and head to point, you know, points north. Bear Mountain to go hiking, Poughkeepsie, all the way north to Albany. And really, these boats were the people's boats. These were boats that allowed all New Yorkers the chance to leave the city, to step onto the water, and to escape. 
Uh, they weren't <coughs> books for the wealthy. They really were for the average New Yorker. So we're bringing back this tradition. Uh, and what we really see our, our vision being is having this movable cultural venue, a destination where you can again leave the city and head to points north. So the project is part cultural venue of how do we really get people out on the water, how do we use our uh, 30,000 square feet and partner with organizations, artists, designers who want to do things on board, hint, hint. Um, but we also see it as an education platform. We're calling it uh, our STEAM education, which might be a little bit on the nose, but we're actually going to be able to restore the 115-year-old STEAM engine and have that in motion again. So it's this amazing laboratory to bring kids and adults uh, into the engine room, into the boiler room, to actually see uh, how a steam engine operates. And it's also an economic development project. So a lot of what we do is we, we do outreach to all the Hudson Valley cities and towns uh, and talking about the fact that we have the capacity to bring 1,500 people to any one of these cities and towns. So uh, if these cities and towns don't want us, we're, we're not going to drop people off. We've been working with the cities and towns to figure out the tourist infrastructure that's needed to build the docks, to partner with cities and towns uh, on Department of State dock applications, uh, and to partner with cities and towns on economic development money related to rebuilding waterfront infrastructure. Uh, the project, this might sound like a crazy project, but it's financially viable. We have a business plan. Um, we've vetted the business plan by a lot of people in the maritime and events world. Uh, and we are revenue positive. So really, that's uh, what I think kept the board invested in the project, is knowing that once the boat's restored, uh, we will have a net revenue. That, and that includes, we'll have a net revenue on top of spending the money on events and cultural programs. Um, we've raised $4.6 million to date. In the past two years, we've moved the boat from Detroit to a shipyard in Toledo. We spent a year there. Um, repairing 900 rivets, replacing two-thirds of the underwater hull. This gives you a sense of the timeline that we're on. Um, we're realistic, it's a long timeline. 2023, plan your wedding. Maybe 2020, <laughs> plan an event in Kingston, where we plan on doing uh, the bulk of the restoration. But one of the things we found, the boat is now docked in Buffalo, uh, but we found that a lot of artists, um, musicians, performers, have kind of fallen in love with the boat in our current space. A stake. So uh, it's, it's not all or nothing. We can start doing events on the boat now, raising revenue from events on the boat now. So here's where we come from. We come from Detroit to Toledo, now we're in Buffalo. Our next big journey is to the Hudson River. As you can see, we are not taking the Erie Canal. We're too big in all dimensions. So we have a great journey ahead of us of nearly 2,000 miles to get the boat to the Hudson River. So, needless to say, we spend a lot of time talking to the Coast Guard and uh, shipping companies and our funders and insurance agents to figure out how this is going to happen. So, uh, it looks as though the tow will happen in 2019 due to the stabilization work that we have to finish in Buffalo. Uh, these are some of the town, cities and towns and state parks that we've been oops, find it, working with uh, to interest them in the boat's arrival. Uh, a sense of what you can do. The boat uh, is a dockside venue, so we're looking at docks uh, north of Canal Street, south of 42nd Street in the Hudson right now, and are in some early conversations uh, because, as the business plan shows, the bulk of the money is actually earned dockside, so it'll be dockside three or four days a week. But the whole thing about the boat is the boat has to move. So we'll be able to move up the Hudson River, as you saw, uh, and also do cruises around Manhattan. Great learning experiences, our STEAM education, uh, STEAM camps for kids during the summer, and then making it all happen. It really wouldn't happen without our supporters. We've raised $1.25 million from New York State to date. We currently have a $500,000 matching grant from New York State that we're going to use in Buffalo to do prep work for the tow. We've had great partners, including Columbia. It's amazing to be part of the incubator space. We've also been lucky to partner with the Hudson Valley Institute here. Uh, and get a lot of students and faculty out of the river. Got the press. Uh, here's just a slide that shows our funding needs and, uh, and a chance to see kind of our post startup operations that we are revenue positive. So we're really excited to be at the incubator because we see ourselves moving from a purely preservation project to a cultural project. So we're using this year at the incubator to figure out partnerships. To really help brand ourselves in this space, 
um, and to hopefully get people up to Buffalo to see this. And the second thing that we're doing is while we are a nonprofit organization, we're exploring the option of becoming a hybrid for profit, not for profit organization because with the investment of the numbers that are showing revenue, while it's a small revenue, not a 30% that an investor might want to see, there are still investors who um, were approaching and pitching to see whether they would want to come on board. So if they do, that will change the structure of our organization. But I wanted to share one thing of being here at Columbia. Uh, it was really as a student that I experienced the Hudson Valley for the first time. I took a class on cultural landscapes, uh, went up and had lunch on, oh, this is, some of you might recognize, sorry, this is uh, Giza, Hudson Valley Initiative on board of uh, this is me presenting, but I had lunch on this porch about 15 years ago uh, as a student at Columbia. And lo and behold, 15 years later, uh, that woman, Joe Davidson, is our board member, and I'm presenting on her porch. So it comes full circle, um, GSAP, all the way. So thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Justine, David, Paul, and all GSAP for the invitation to be part of this uh, amazing panel and discussion. My name is Alejandro Navarrete Llopis. Uh, I studied here at Columbia and I taught here as well a couple of years ago and, and now I'm teaching at Pratt Institute. And I'm the principal of NAMI Studio. That is an office that works at the intersection of art and architecture to design spaces for alternative social, cultural and material connections. Since 2005, since 2005, I've been practicing in Spain as a designer, researcher, and curator in speculative designs during competitions in different offices, as for example, Solid Arquitectura, and receiving several prizes that later turned into big structures, in this case, a social housing building in Madrid. And while doing competitions, I co-founded a collective of architects called PACMA that was working around questions on citizenship and identity and proposing a more engaged agency of the citizen in the transformation of the urban environment. We work on a series of projects called City Create City, proposing site-specific interventions, exhibitions, actions and events. All these images that you have seen here are from Toledo Creates Toledo and City Creates Toledo, uh, City, sorry, Toledo Creates Toledo and Cáceres Create Cáceres as part of like this longer endeavor of City Creates City. We had also the opportunity to work as editors on a publication, including our contribution with a text and an interview to the book. In 2014, uh, after graduating here in, in Colombia, from the AD program and after practicing some years in New York, I was selected together with the After Belonging Agency to create the Oslo Architecture Triennale 2016. The project entitled After Belonging, a Triennale in Residence on Residence and the Ways We Stay in Transit and allows, analyzes how architecture intervenes in our attachment to places and collectivities, where do we belong? as well as our relation to the objects that we own, share, exchange, and produce. How do we manage our belongings? This uh, contemporary transformation that we were trying to describe has destabilized the notion of residence, undermining spatial permanence, property, and identities. And we were looking not only to the asylum seeker centers from previous images, but also our own houses that were open through home sharing platforms, or the spaces of, ma of massive tourism to the Caribbean Sea or other geographies. And we proposed six different platforms to analyze the role or the agency of architecture beyond the building. Uh, the, the After Belonging publication for us was a space for architectural production and experimentation. We commissioned more than 20 new essays for the publication, so it was not understood only as a catalog of the exhibition. The conference was a space where architecture is presented, connected, and contested, incorporating relevant voices into the discussion. And two exhibitions that we curated and designed, the on residence exhibition and the in residence exhibition, were sites to test new spatial configurations and different material experimentations. 
and uh, two additional platforms that we launched for the first time on, on this edition in 2016 was the Academy. There was a student forum gathering more than 120 students from like 10 different universities around the world into a knowledge sharing experiment. The Academy for us was a space to test work protocols and academic conversations. And finally, the embassy that we launched um, at the closing event of the Triennale was um, represented, was a special installation that we did at the Oslo City Hall that represented the ideas of stateless democracies. It was for us a space to test the agency of art and architecture to rethink political representation. And this year, well, two, two weeks ago, um, I just got a grant from NISCA, that is a funding program from the state of New York, to work on a one-year-long research project that I will develop at uh, G7 Incubator. The project, this is not your door, the spaces of ex exclusion in New York, the lottery, the membership, and the application explores the mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion at three different scales, the domestic, leisure, and educational spaces in the city of New York. The first case study will look at the contemporary domestic interiors of mixed income developments resulting from the inclusionary housing programs. I will come back later to this case while uh, I explain the methodology of the, the year-long project. And the second case study analyzes the leisure interiors of social class offering privacy, security, and comfort. I think it seems uh, particularly relevant to look at these spaces nowadays, as President Trump spent more than 30% of his presidency time in his uh, Mar-a-Lago private club. And so this space has become his winter um, uh, White House, as he, on his own words, providing a space for informal access to the president to its 500 members. Together with the proliferation of initiatives as the Global Entry Program, that is, a, as a, that is a club that facilitates rapid entrance to US and other countries, these privileged associations activate exclusive communities and alternative forms of citizenship. The project will focus on current forms of membership derived from these social clubs and the role in the definition of daily life in New York. The initial study will include business clubs, university clubs, fraternities and sororities, but also beach clubs and well-being clubs, among others. The third case study will focus on the educational settings of colleges and universities. Um, these spaces are now responding to a discussion on fair admission, diversity and minorities, as the government is, on the last month, questioning and investigating the affirmative, the affirmative action policies. With the contemporary deregulation, marketial, marketalization, we say, and privatization of learning spaces, universities face challenges of becoming global forces run as and for business. So, focusing a little bit on the methodology of this, this next year, the project uh, applied to the first case study, the project This Is Not Your Door, will map and draw the connection between the transformation of the urban landscape, the admission to these interior environments, and the design of new communities articulated through the legal documents of the lottery, in this case, but also the membership and the application processes. This regulation and documents granting access shape these spaces of New York City or the spaces of New York City designing economic, class, gender, age and race differences. On the other hand, this research will also analyze how the notion of home, in this case, is represented in different media and how it's occupied by its residents. It will focus on the design and representation of the domestic interiors, the lobby and amenities, the spaces of well-being, and we'll also focus the attention on the technologies providing an immersive experience to unbuilt structures and apartments with dioramas 
three-dimensional holographic projections, augmented virtual reality, and 3D walkthrough available in our own computers at home. And to establish a connection between the representational technologies that the media and the real estate market is using and the actual uh, daily life of the inhabitants, the project will chronicle the community's experience. I will do a series of site visits, an interview, and, and interviews to the residents and, and experts, and I will commission a series of photo, photo essays from local photographers in order to document these interiors. So, this protocol will serve for the three case studies and will result in three essays that will include the graphic material of the, of the map, the photo essay, and um, the excerpts from interviews to the residents and the experts on the topic. These are like the three photographers, possible photographers. And the aim is not only to unveil and raise awareness on the relationship between the legal frames and the places we inhabit, but also to envision alternative models of inclusion and accessibility. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Lauren. This is Ryan and Stephen Mentor, graduated from GSAP in 2016, and I guess we graduated from the incubator just this past year. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about our projects and um, kind of what we did while at the incubator. Uh, so QSpace is a queer architecture research and design collaborative. We define ourselves as mixing queer theory, social justice, and design practice. Aside from producing projects such as coded plumbing, QSpace is a platform for research projects by students and professionals working with queerness in the built environment. So, um, as some of you may know, we ourselves started here at QSAP in 2014 as a, a student organization called QSAP, QSAP, it's a little bit of a mouthful, in response to what we viewed as a huge lack of conversation and mentorship from openly queer folks in the field of architecture. Um, through social events, QSAP provided mentorship um, a space, sorry, for LGBTQ students at Columbia and brought lectures and programming that reinforce the impact of queer people in the fields. Um, as a side note, uh, on being openly gay in architecture, if you actually Google gay architect, um, the first hit is from a, is an architect form from 2009. Um, it kind of is just a speculating on the sexuality of a few um, male architects and whether or not uh, their sexuality affects their body of work and, uh, some chiming in to be like, this is Abby. Um, so that's kind of the state of things. Um, but back to QSAP. Uh, at the end of our final year, there was a major event that brought queer theory, social justice, and design practice together in a concrete way, and that was the passage of North Carolina House Bill 2. So we decided we needed to be proactive, and that the bathroom bill issue was a design challenge. This launched QSpace, almost the professional side of the student group. Um, along with, and it also started our passion for the bathroom and our first project, Coded Plumbing. So, um, a little bit of background on HB2. Um, it, uh, along with other bathroom bills throughout various states like Texas, Kentucky, um, they often define gender as, quote, biological sex and, and dictate that people must use um, the bathroom corresponding to their birth certificate in schools and other public spaces. And the impact is that these bills criminalized transgender and gender non-conforming folks, putting them in impossible and sometimes violent situations. As architects, we began to investigate how gender binaries and the codes which govern architectural production could be reimagined and subverted in the physical space of the bathroom. So the way we started was actually just a few feet from here in the bathrooms of Brownies, where we had exhibitions inviting the public to unravel plumbing codes and design standards at a one-to-one -one scale. Um, this then went on to a Van Allen um, exhibition on the street. Um, so what we were doing is coupling the codes with actual bathroom bills. We emphasised the biopolitical dictation of gender and sexuality in spaces that typically are considered banal. And just a quick shout out to Mark Taylor for letting us completely destroy the bathrooms and brownies and right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very nice of him. Um, so um, then we received a Kinney Grant, another shout out to GSAP, um, mm -hmm. and on that we traveled to North Carolina to do site research on how HB2 is inspiring a, a bathroom resistance movement. And we met with LGBTQ leaders and individuals to discuss how the bill is impacting our communities. Um, and actually while we were 
somewhere over there in Asheville was when we, we got the email that we got into the incubator. So that was a really um, exciting moment for us. Um, so what we discovered while we were there was a lot of open resistance and signage declaring safe spaces, um, a lot of attempts to express inclusivity, um, a lot of signage on doors like, uh, screw you, HP2, like, everyone welcome here, um, safe space. Uh, so we saw, we learned also from people that we talked to that the single cell locking facilities were often considered to be the safest spaces in the current binary system, um, while encouraging signage um, such as this was a great, was sort of a band-aid, um, an effective band-aid on the two-gendered two system. Oops, wait. Um, we also learned that bathroom bills and gender segregated facilities don't just burden trans and gender non-conforming folks, they also impact families and people with disabilities with other sex caretakers. So we found the three main types of bathrooms, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, with varying degrees of separation. The signage indicates who can enter while the public um, subjectively determine who has made the correct decision or not. So this fast forwards us to what we're doing now and um, our idea of the all-inclusive restroom. So the idea where everyone can go together, wash their hands and whatever else we do in the bathroom. So it's an important step to designing more inclusively and as architects, and architects can design and fight for these spaces. And should. Okay, um, so beyond legal codes, um, I'm working with the plumbing code and that sort of changing in New York City. Um, there is another layer which is design standards which architects follow. So beyond the code, we sort of have some rules about that sort of like add to the gendering of bathroom spaces so on the left. And these are drawings from the Van Allen exhibition. On the left, you have a men's bathroom, you see the really standard urinals, stalls on the right, a women's bathroom, and there's just minor details, actually, oh, there's nothing to but there's minor details in women's bathrooms. Um, you'll have trash cans between each stall for sanitary products, um, uh, which do not exist in men's bathrooms. Probably you've never noticed that that's not a thing because you only go to one or the other. And you know some men do actually menstruate, so that's an issue. And the other thing is a, a shelf below the mirror that we most certainly have in women's bathrooms. It's like where we can put our purse and do our makeup. Um, and stuff like that. So when we really kind of peel it all the way, I totally lost my text. Um, when we really strip it all the way, what really happens with the bathroom is there's just fixtures, convenient ways to eliminate waste from our bodies, wash our hands, um, check our lips in the mirror. And so we are kind of trying to think about how we can, how these fixtures can be reassembled and reimagined and how we can untangle these sort of Victorian notions of gender and privacy and safety and create something that reflects an expanding understanding of inclusivity. So this is what got us into the incubator. And while there, we began compiling the interviews, documentations, drawings, and the design insights that we collected into concrete outputs. So while there and still today, um, we are Sorry, I just went off track there. Um, we are beginning to build our outputs. And just to give you our elevator pitch, even though the incubator is not one, it was one that you do go through workshop and something that does bring you back to where you are. So central to our practice is the belief that design and could and should play an active role in responding to social change. And we hope to offer the tools in which to create it. Um, so, as part of our outlook, we're working on CAD blocks. So this is an example of a really standard CAD block package that probably a lot of you recognize in this room. Um, architects download and plug these elements in to compose spaces that are considered standard, such as fire stairs, furniture, furniture configurations, and yes, even whole rooms like bathrooms. Um, so, uh, so our output for coded plumbing will include CAD blocks, 3D models, signage, and even written guidelines. Um, for how to um, convince your clients. Um, so uh, we will offer this free online toolkit as alternative solutions, empowering architects with the tools to become better advocates for inclusive bathroom design. And of course, my catalog is complete without some queer scale figures, including a conic RuPaul. So, but we're continuing to focus on our broader goal of creating space and conversation on design in the queer community. So we're building online and IRL communities 
and resources for career, career voices in the profession and in academia. Um, we use the incubator as a space to hold events like sign making parties for queer architect protest together events. Um, we participated in events like the Florida Union Fair, which we only found out about through the New Inc. Slack group, which was a, uh, like a social justice like science fair where we sat in a booth and talked about who they were as an organization and were able to kind of meet collaborators and talk about, it was like a post-election moment, like let's all do something. Um, so that was great. And we also are active on social media and we like to call it like gift activism or we'll create a gift when we're really angry and circulate it on Twitter and um, mostly among other people who are also angry, so to be determined how effective that is. Um, We've also been working with uh, students that are LGBTQ groups in their architecture schools. Um, the idea came from meeting with several students um, who were in New York for the summer and come to the incubator to meet and talk about collaboration and uh, wanting to get involved and wanting to go back to their schools and start something similar and engage with professors and other students. Um, so we've sort of uh, set up a Google Drive uh, with resources and insights and we're hoping to build more of like a social network between uh, students all over the country. So one of our projects that was unexpected in Incubator but came out of it was our Critical Happy Hour. It was an event, um, it was a series in collaboration with F, F Architecture who sat just behind us <laughs> in the space and it is a series of events that examine how design thinking and critical discourse can create change. The idea is to create a space for conversation and more importantly action. We hosted four events in total while in the incubator, um, engaging with people from the New Inc. section of the incubator, uh, institutions like the AAA and even um, recent GSAP students. Um, we're hoping that this event is going to pick up as we are currently moving into our new space. Um, a and new, I, new Inc. <laughs> um, in our recently converted basement, and we're having. Um, F Architecture join us there and slowly uh, building artists and collaborators back in that space. Um, our next major project uh, we, we were, are beginning to work on is a Queer Architecture Archive, an online archive of architecture and urban planning projects um, on queer topics in the built environment. Uh, through this project we're seeking to broaden the field of architectural discourse by both reinterpreting its history and shining a light on lesser known works and figures um, we're hoping to establish a queer body of work, not just from queer identified designers, but on projects that impact queer identities. Um, and we also just received a NISCA grant. Um, so we're going to really start diving into this project and doing some public programming with um, Van Allen in the spring, I think is when we're supposed to do it. So we're really excited about that, and that's us. And we'll be happy to answer any questions on being incubator members. It was awesome. <laughs> Right. This is the last lecture. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks for having me. As, as uh, Karen mentioned at the beginning, I'm kind of a, a crossover, and I'll talk about the physical transition uh, of you know changing from one corner of the space into the other corner, um, and uh, how. But I want to talk about the GSAP incubator, how all this. Um, physical connections or things, uh, kind of uh, physical proximity or the propinquity effect led to all kinds of projects. Basically, 90% of what I'm doing now came in some direct or indirect way from the GSAP incubator in the past year. Just quite, once you start tracing it, physically tracing it in the space becomes quite, you know, an intense, uh, <laughs> kind of self-reflective experience. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm an architect here, graduated, um, I, I um, actually only two years ago, but it feels like forever. I've been working between New York and Vienna, um, establishing more of a traditional architecture practice in Vienna, where I have a partner um, where we're actually making buildings, and uh, more of a speculative academic practice here. I teach two classes here, representation, ADR, and also um, a class called Tools for Show, which is about exhibition design. And uh, I also have a new name because you this one is hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right now I'm running under a bus, but we'll see if that sticks. It's easier to say, it's harder. <laughs> um, and I'm doing a bunch of sort of uh, 
let's say, consulting and freelance projects under that name, right now, kind of based at the incubator. Um, so to start with a zoom in, uh, Agustina is sitting in the back, two spaces are right in front of me. <laughs> My table is usually messy, and you see below, down below, you see a sort of tables that are used for model building and for um, pinning up, and there's a printer up there in the corner, which was extremely useful. Um, <laughs> so I think the first thing about Incubator was the physical infrastructure space, you know, the, the just allowing you as a young architect to, to place your things, to have a fixed desk, not kind of a co-working thing where you have to check in and be at a different desk every day to really kind of inhabit, inhabit that physical space. And that really allowed me to develop these architecture projects in the past year. This is one uh, a small community center in lower Austria that uh, is still not under construction. It's been gone for four years, hopefully <laughs> next year. <laughs> uh, you know, the good thing is when you work on something for so long, you can just redraw it every, like, <laughs> over and over again. So this is sort of the fifth iteration. Uh, I've, I've started to like just hand sketch over it again. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. But the other project that kind of started later, uh, it's more of a corporate nature, it's an office building, uh, in Upper Austria, uh, and it's, uh, it's sort of an office building for a factory. That one is actually inspired construction first of September, so that's really, really exciting. There's a webcam um, that you, I can go on, <laughs> and it's just a pile of dirt, but it's really exciting to watch. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's basically, I mean, that, it was interesting to be working on an office within an incubator and because this is quite a conservative company and you know trying to convince some of the most basic ideas that actually may be running into people kind of the point of this lecture that this that this is a positive effect uh, was a hard sell actually in this, in, in this world this kind of business uh, there are machine building uh, machine machine building company and they they really wanted their own offices, they wanted to close the door, they didn't want it, you know, they wanted as little interaction, as little distraction as they saw it as possible from other people. And so creating kind of an open courtyard, things that seem really straightforward was, you know, creating kind of a social zone, creating a, a space where people could meet was, was a challenge to, to convince them, but we did it, and now the, the building is, um, this is a view of the eight um, And the, so this is Agustin sending me an email, <laughs> and uh, the email said, <laughs> the email said, there is, a, you know, you should apply for the future architecture platform. It was one of out of many emails, I have to say, that where he said, you do this, do that. I'm like, okay, okay. And this was, um, you know, actually, it was past the deadline, past midnight. I just threw together a project. Uh, it was this like, open call for ideas, a European network. And I was like, I don't even really know what it is, but I'm gonna just. Send it in. It was an online form, pretty easy to apply. So okay. Then um, I uh, somehow the email that I got accepted into that program landed into my spam folder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and team called me uh, really excitedly. Oh my God! You're this, you know, you got you, you were you're in, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Um, but it had an incredible effect on my year. I, um, I went to Ljubljana, where I'm from, where I was born, in last February, which is conveniently just the time when I quit my job at the Met, so I just sort of I had time to go and travel. And I um, and I spoke there, and the idea was this kind of a matchmaking conference. So you were supposed to match with um, sort of local European institutions, and they would invite you to come to their uh, you know festival or event or lecture. And they would fly you into their country and you'd be able to do something there. So this was an installation I did in Graz, um, where in, in a storefront in the house of the tour, which is uh, you know, kind of this, uh, it was based on, on this idea of ephemerality. And, and it was really just spending a whole week in that, in, within the storefront building something in a way without too much of a, um, there were almost no drawings that preceded that. It was kind of a very intuitive pr process and really uh, ripping off that idea that architecture can be almost nothing, uh, and but then anchored by a very solid, real marble column in the middle. So the, the movable objects, the things that are usually, uh, you know, moving a space became too heavy to move because nobody could pick this up. It was too too heavy, and then the, the walls are actually the uh, ephemeral parts. So kind of in Berlin, we had a I collaborated with a young Italian firm called Amore Agency, which I think. They, they did um, a performance in the space. 
And there were, you know, this was just one out of this. I went to Pristina and I led a workshop there at the um, National Museum, which was really interesting because there was um, really no infrastructure there. There was no information to be had before before I arrived. And uh, you know, they are opening in February 2018, and I thought there would be a collection to work with, but it turned out not to be the case, or the, the guy with the key to the collection never appeared. So, <laughs> so we, um, we worked with the building itself, worked with a bunch of young architecture students from Pristina, and uh, you know, came up with sort of ideas for, for how, how to, Karen mentioned the museum experience, and you know, she works at this very high New York level, but this experience made me realize that all of our world museums are struggling with these questions and that it could be kind of a model or an interesting idea to, to consult and to consult beyond the New York level but sort of consult in, in places that, that really have uh, questions and issues and here they were really, you know, Kosovo was trying to build a national identity as a place so this museum really has a very important function and they, they, the media was extremely <coughs> interested in everyone wanted to, you know, talk to us and, and kind of learn about, about this workshop that we were doing. So it was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, and then that was a kind of an indirect effect of that, but through the people that I met at the platform, uh, I heard about the Binali Hall for, for Slovenia for the year 2000, so the next Binali 2018, and also um, got selected to participate uh, as one of the authors in the, in the Slovenian contribution. Um, so this is a work in progress. The topic is about water. We uh, I can't say too much about it yet, but uh, this all came out of just one little email. Um, this is uh, me talking to F Architecture on the couches in the back. <laughs> they, <laughs> they. Um, oh, and then, and then you see the room with the presentation. This is where we also gave one of the incubator presentations, and uh, this is where. So, Amount is not here, but this is where I kind of pitched my class, my seminar to her. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, you know, who knows? It, it would have, maybe it would have happened. Maybe it, does, it wouldn't have. You don't really know, right? But it definitely was a chance to talk to her in person and to kind of say, "Hey, I have this idea for a seminar." And you know, um, then uh, yeah. So the architecture conversation. Uh, it's actually something I'm still working on. It's a comic book about what it means to be a professional woman <laughs> and an uh, implicit bias. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully um, I will complete it one day. I'm still working. <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't matter. It keeps, um, I keep collecting uh, good situations, so it's almost like a form of entertain entertainment when something happens again. I'm like, oh, I can, I can draw it out. It feels like drawing is a good way to deal with it because if you would write it down it would just sound like a very epic long but a boring story but I think, yeah. um, and then uh, this is me talking to Julia uh, Kagalinski she is the director of New Inc and I took I booked an office hour with her just because I don't know she seemed cool and I was like I want to talk to her about my project and I had already so my pitch at the incubator was already very much about at the G7 incubator was about museums and I wanted you know from working at the Met, I, I got all these ideas about uh, uh, sort of thinking about exhibitions and uh, analyzing them and trying to understand how the how the exhibitions and process really works. But I was it, this was the point last year when I was quite lost, honestly. I was sort of like, yeah, I have all these ideas, I don't really know. I need sort of a structure, an infrastructure to do it, and I need deadlines because otherwise I don't do anything. And uh, <laughs> she said, well, there's this Knight Foundation grant that we just got. And that was a month before the deadline or so. And I was like, oh, cool. And uh, you know, I didn't even see it as something that I would apply for, but then I was seeing, and even other people who were at the school, uh, and Dr. Da and David, they all kind of were like, yeah, you should apply. And so that led to this. <laughs> <laughs> a few months later, I was like, wow, I'm an innovator. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, you know, it, it just basically was a summary my application was basically a summary of ideas that I had collected in the past year, the Joseph Incubator, which was very much uh, about sort of the back end of the museum uh, process. So uh, you can sort of simplify it in, um, 
in the kind of figure of uh, the checklist, which is kind of the piece of information that you get from a curator um, when they, uh, you know, when they when they introduce you to the exhibition. And so, the um, the problem for the exhibition designers is that, that from this list, so there's something that happens between the list and the exhibition itself that the exhibition designer is in charge of. And uh, it's sort of this, this hidden process, or this kind of magical process that, that you go through and the doctor really knows what exactly you're doing. You're kind of like taking information from the list, putting it into, the, into different software, and then at some point you create a plan and present it back to the curator. So uh, what I've been doing now is kind of really, really breaking down that, that process step by step into, into the elements that are visible, the presentations and the elements that are invisible. Um, and, uh, and kind of all the actors that are involved with it because it's not, obviously not just a curator and exhibition designer, just uh, a bunch of different, depending of course on the scale of the exhibition and um, the complexity, but there can be dozens of different collaborators. Obviously the construction team at the end, that's sort of the two pinpoints, you know, the curator and the, and the construction at the very end, but then there's conservators, all these people. And uh, kind of mapping the data, the data sets that come out of that. So each person that is involved in exhibition adds more information into your checklist. And so the idea, when I'm prototyping and what I'll demo, there's a, we have a demo day in January, and what I'll demo in January is, is, um, is uh, kind of a, a, a prototype of, of that uh, parametric checklist. And so this is sort of defining this, this pinch points where you know there's basically no adequate um, software at the moment, or people sort of just waste time basically by um, uh, very, very inefficiently working with this list. And it's, um, so it sounds kind of very technical, but actually the challenge is more human than, than technical. It's more about, uh, you know, if, if you think of the Costa Workshop, more about uh, kind of connecting existing technology uh, with those smaller institutions and helping them kind of use it in a very productive way. And the idea is that this kind of back-end process would also inform the front end, because once you have that information in a model, it would be also much easier to create, let's say, a VR environment or a map or things or, you know, digital apps, online things that, uh, that will just come out of one centralized information model. Um, yeah, this is me right now in the space. Um, <laughs> Uh, quite happy to move closer to the window, and uh, I'm working with uh, a girl, uh, Marisa. She's um, she's actually not a GSAP grad, <laughs> but somebody who was my student kind of uh, connected me to her because he was a, a water leader, and then she applied, and now she she works with me, which is great. And then Joachim was in the space yesterday, so you know the effort keeps expanding. There will be new connections, and that's it. Thank you. We want to give it a chance. Um, I think first for for any questions from the audience, but then I would like to invite people who are particularly interested also to um, come up afterwards and talk more informally. Um, so I, I probably will resist uh, asking a question, but I will not resist the fact that um, uh, uh, or, or a kind of quick observation that I think, you know, what we've heard today, I mean, it's probably obvious, but I think it's worth stating, is um, an incredibly diverse and interesting range of different um, projects and possibilities for graduates from GSAP, young practices, new modes of practice, you know, and we've heard about a research lab, a nonprofit, um, several commission-based firms, but that are also kind of uh, blurring the lines between commissions and other projects, um, some curatorial and grant-based projects, um, even an activist organization. Some started at GSAP and continued at something like the incubator or at least after school, and some are continuing to work out of GSAP either at the incubator or uptown or both and in different ways. Um, and I think all are kind of incredibly interesting and, and productive and I think could cause us to um, think about practice anew or think about what it means to, to, um, to be working in architecture, culture, and the city these days. Um, so I, I won't, you know, I have a couple of questions in mind that I'm, I'm not going to ask, but I still say I'm turning it over to the audience, you know, if anyone has a question that they want to ask of the group as a whole or Uh, and 
question is kind of like um, more also design interested. Like how, uh, like in the design of, in, in taking your practice as a project and as a design project, um, like the designing of new financial models is kind of, I think, one of the biggest uh, exciting and challenging things. And in design, we don't really learn that, you know? It's kind of like one of the things that's like for the real world. Um, so I'm just interested in how you approach those in terms of new structures, new uh, like types, you know, like the, the subscription model in, in things like mine now is becoming kind of prevalent, but how things like that or other um, method, mechanisms of funding um, make the conception of activities. That's something we could be really helpful for because I think QC is proud, like obviously we're a nonprofit and after several conversations with um, mentors there, it was like, well, are you like, do you really want to like deal with the IRS all the time? We're like, oh. Um, and so we like became an LLC and had to learn what that was all about. And um, so I think it's a lot of trial and error. And we, um, as we said, just got our first real money grant. Um, and that's new, and that was really just a matter of like, Again, like an email from Augustine, um, being like, "Let me this, but," um, and so, um, yeah, I think right now we're still kind of grant dependent and have other jobs, but um, I'm interested in learning, like, thinking of new ways to sort of fund and like grow as an organization, with sort of like a lack of resources. I think I never realized in uh, leading GSAC how fundraising is such a key part of all the projects we're doing. Uh, but I don't know if that's something we could have been taught here or in class. I, I tend to think not. But I think there's a, a hustle that has to happen that everyone, I mean, you got, got to GSAP, obviously you know how to hustle, and, but it's a continuation of this. And at least for our project, we, we're not entirely sure how we're going to raise our 18 million, but we can tell you we're constantly out pitching corporations, foundations, the state government individuals, and it's going to just be a, kind of continuing to have that flexibility of seeing what comes through and how adaptable we have to be um, at those moments. I think we have a lot to learn from you. In my case, that I work as an independent designer is very precarious. Uh, so I sustain my practice through teaching, but teaching is not only like a financial uh, uh, like, uh, income, but also it's a space where I'm like exploring and expanding those uh, research interests that I have. So through that, and then uh, I, I was invited to, um, to an event here to talk about like new practices, and I was like telling the students that I check the ground like every morning. It's kind of like when I'm like having the coffee, I'm like, okay, which is the next grant, you know? So like through teaching and grants, uh, that's the way I, yeah, I survive, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, similar here, I, I think you have to become really comfortable with not knowing what's happening long term. Uh, <laughs> because again, when I quit, you know, 10 months ago, I had one project and but then I think by one thing is the business plan that's really really useful. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm still this now in the second round, I'm still learning a lot. Um, and I agree that I'm not sure if it's school necessarily. People always talk we need more of that in school. I'm like, well, it's also not relevant for everyone. And it's it's something you learn in real life from my drafting. You know, it's sort of the, this practice that you have to have to do it. You know, but I think the the short term uncomfortable. Aspect is is what this is psychological, and you have to kind of learn that. But it's helpful to position yourself as an expert in something, even though you're not. <laughs> and people will come to you <laughs> and give you, you know, I've really spent probably weeks this year negotiating contracts, and I made a lot of mistakes. I like, I've mean, learned so much just from negotiating the contracts. Like for one project, we didn't specify how many vendors should have. And they just wanted more and more and more, and they, you know, it's it takes time, but they didn't care because it was not in the contract. So I think everybody really goes into this business world, self 
running something that's the, the first first product that we run into. I don't know about tax, we'll see about that. <laughs> graduating from GSAP, you're kind of like trajectory is to go work for a big firm and you leave and you start sort of like low and like learning to assign value to your work and yourself like it was something we learned in the incubator space which I think why the incubator is so special like Dominic the architecture is maybe here so the incubator is like more up here and so like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm sorry I'm actually that one about that <laughs> and, and it's like you know we would sit with um Someone from the computer be like, oh well, you should negotiate this way. Like your work is valuable. You should be pitching. And like you said, mentioned pitch, and we didn't know what a pitch deck was. Graduating from G, so we're like, you mean our like slides? Like, <laughs> um, and so those are the kind of things to learn. Like, like learning between like being architects, watching the artists around us, and then watching the people that were like legitimately in the incubator, like raising like millions of dollars for their tech startups. That was like a really interesting confluence of people and sort of being able to be like, oh, I'm going to borrow that, or like, I can learn from that, I think was a way to learn. Yeah, I was going to say, I spent a year in the tech incubator mm -hmm. on another project that I didn't talk about, and I think the big takeaway from that was pitch all pitch. the time. Yeah. And I remember the first few emails I sent out, you know, you check your email, has they have they written that? They written that. <laughs> then I realized it's just about volume. Send a lot, and then maybe you'll get one response or two responses. <laughs> but I think that's part of it, is just keep sending things out there, and you'll ultimately get responses. No, I wanted to expand on your idea about the role of the GSAP Incubator. I think it is a very important platform to establish dialogue and connection. So I was like working for a year at home, and now I'm like at the incubator having all these meetings with like cultural agents, where I'm like presenting what I'm doing, hearing the feedback. So I think like establishing those links is like very important in order to you know advance your practice, bring the level of the discussion to you know the next step. Um, like figure it out which is your audience, how are you going to you know address your audience, which is the format, and, and so on. So I think it, it is a, an important space. I don't know what is going to happen in the future, <laughs> as the new ink is going to be renovated. But um, for me, I mean, um, for all of us, no, I guess it's, it is important. It is an important space. Mm -hmm. And of course, our team is our okay. <laughs> our host and leader. <laughs> I'm going to ask a very, maybe it's a very stupid question, but, um, sorry, I'm not a stupid question, but it's like, what, it's very simple, what, I'm sorry, what, what it means to have an office space on Bowery? I think because you are there, you have pick up, did an amazing drawing about all the like, connection they have in the physical space, and trying to go back to architecture, um, what it means to have a, a, like a real office space, I mean, Probably connected with the with with the um, romantic idea of the architecture studio. Um, most of the people graduated and still going to, as as, as Lauren said, going to work for someone came in that space. And um, it's true that for me as the manager and for them, we all and, and David that we are all learning from each other. Mm -hmm. But I want to I want to know what's what's your expectations or, or or your idea before coming in. What it means to be in Manhattan, you know, in, in terms of how what what means to not be in Brooklyn and be still in the island. I don't know if you have any thought about it. No, I mean, for me, it's, it's a luxury to be like very close to the new, to the new museum, you know, so you can like, if you, you cannot work for like more hours and have like a five minute break, you can go to the museum, look for, you know, an exhibition and forget about uh, your daily life uh, problems. But I do have to say that I have some contradictions or some contradictory uh, feelings because we have like the Bowery mission on one side, but then if you like like walk for like five minutes, suddenly everybody is like having cocktails at three p.m. on a Monday. <laughs> 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 miserable, and also yeah, you know, like those frictions. Uh, yeah. it, it makes it very interesting, but it also questions how do we manage to live in New York? No, like um, I don't know. So like, uh, and work, not only live and work. In yeah, the live and work and survive and you know, with all those spaces of exclusion that I was like talking about. Mm -hmm. That is like, uh, like oh, how do you say, when you are like, well, making the structures of power continue, you know? Um, so, but, but I think it's a luxury. It's, it's a very nice space. And, yeah. and for me, it's funny you said 
specifically called out being on the Bowery. My first studio project at Columbia was the Bowery. This was 2001. Uh, and there were still five gas stations on the Bowery. That fancy $15 cocktail bar just opened next to the Bowery Mission. Um, and it was just a radically different place. So every time I walk by, I still see, you know, building circa 2001 and remember what classmates worked on what project. So it's, there's kind of a little uh, nostalgia coming back to that space. But what I'm particularly excited about with the incubator is um, our project had been hosted um, in what you could call an early incubator. It's a, a collective of preservation organizations. And it was a wonderful space to be in, um, but it lacked an urgency. And it, that was driving me nuts. And I think that the one thing I like about the space that we're in is there's the urgency of bowering, or the frenetic element to it, but also the space itself. Like, all of you, you're all like there to do biz and you're getting stuff done and it's fast moving and I think that's the most exciting and appealing thing about the space in general. This isn't a space that's quiet and you know, everyone kind of does their own thing. No, you kind of look over and you're like, oh, I'm going to work fast. <laughs> so I think that kind of energy in the space is really a big attractor. Uh, picking up on urgency, and I think you mentioned, you mentioned deadlines. Uh, What's your take on the fact that you can be there for a year and then you're kicked out, you're incubated, you're free to leave? Uh... But clearly, I must laugh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think I think that's part of that's the same uh, answer. You know, as with Jesse, where you have to kind of get uncomfortable with not knowing uh, what's happening in a year. Uh, and I'm definitely, I was thinking, should I be just like an infinite, you know, incubated person <laughs> that will always hop from one to the next, the next new lab and there. I mean, it, it, I think it's a new, and I meet people like that at the incubator. There is a whole crowd of people who just live from one fellowship to the next, and when does it stop? And, you know, it's also in terms of the range of age, it goes until until 50, and I was thinking also, now I kind of, you know, I have an office, an architect office, but I don't really have a physical space, so I do even, like my own space that I designed, is that even an office? Because it's sort of very different from the traditional notion, which a lot of my friends in Vienna are doing. They find a space, mm -hmm. you know, they set up, uh, they kind of create an identity with a space and set up the, the frame, the images the right way on the wall, and everything's like really thoughtful, and then they sit there and they wait for projects. <laughs> <laughs> Or sometimes it doesn't, but the, it's a different approach than to just run all this without a, without really having your own space. And um, I brought my dad, my dad there really proudly, like, look at that, and he's like, you have this much. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it's you, you just have to be comfortable with, with that in between state. I think. And maybe it's changing the way that ideas and products are being produced. I mean, compared to the, the yeah. Euro European model, you would say. I mean, what all these new spaces are bringing is probably new. We are all like exper experimenting new way of producing projects. Okay. And, and also, I think that the question that Jesse was seeing is very important because that's something that we, as a manager, struggle to see where I, where I find resources to these people to fund their project. Um, it's very complicated because all the other creative practices like film, theater, art, uh, or even the tech industry, they have that so well organized. I mean, and they, I mean, there are people really well. And we're architecture. I mean, not the, the one that's going to be built, the, the one that the real space is going to jump into it. What have happened with all these practices and how are in the middle? I think that's that's the big question. And then, I mean, this, the first one I thought is, is the, the incubator GSAP is really a mixture between what an academic, what's the relationship with the school, but also how, how, is, how what is the fuel or what is the funding for all these. Like, uh, Expanded practices. There, it's true that we are defining every year because we have a new corporate coming in the new year. So maybe we can enter one more question. There is one. Um, you mentioned that besides learning from each other, sure. Um, besides learning from each other, you said you know watching what other people are doing. There was also the idea of mentorship that was. Um, mentioned and I was wondering is are there formal practices within the incubator for mentorship uh, of both the members um, and, and how what does that look like and just if you could speak to maybe that a little bit. 
Yeah, New Inc. Um, they have the staff all hold office hours, and I think for the like actual New Inc. members, you have there's more of a structure, like reporting yeah. kind of. GSUB's more of a free for all, but we're allowed, we're like allowed to go to their. It's kind of a nice like in between, so you can kind of get mentored as much as you want to. It's not like forced stuff on you. Um, but those sessions were really helpful. And we went to a bunch of like information sessions and kind of showed our faces and did as much as we could. And then yeah, yeah, it was really helpful. No, I mean, uh, uh, it's true that uh, you don't only have access to the infrastructure that you saw. Uh, it's incredible, but also our GSA members have access to the new and professional development program where they learn, uh, you know, information and mentorship and advice from business model to storytelling mm -hmm. to funding, etc. Also, uh, in our size, I start like inviting people to host some kind of office hours. Some of them are one-on-one. -on -one. Some of them are, are are like more general. Depends. Uh, or the needs of the people. And I think that, I don't know, uh, it's interesting to see that the incubator is something in between, I think David said it before, like between all people are already outside the school of the alumni network and also the, the student. And personally, like me being in the middle, I all the time work between Francesca, who is running career services, and it's my link and my connection with the current students. And we are we right now like sending email like to the student to see if they want to come and talk to our members. Um, again, this is a trial. We are, we're working on it. We don't know how it's gonna go. And also with Eva, that was with us before, she's the one that is also connecting the project with the whole alumni network. So somehow the incubator like connects different like points of the GISA. And I think that's that's incredible. Yeah, the two specific things, you know, just like everyone's saying, but two specific things we're experimenting with this year in our spirit of trying out different things as and learning as we go is um, kind of flipping it a little bit, having the incubator members hold office hours for current students. Mm -hmm. So thinking, you know, you guys are already raising millions of dollars, starting your own firm, you know, creating an activist organization, mm -hmm. you know, doing amazing projects. Our students that are here now at Uptown School should be coming to you for mm -hmm. mentorship. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to try to offer that. Mm -hmm. And we also know that there's an incredible network of GSAP alumni who have been doing this expanded modes of practice before the term incubator like, was popular. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're trying to bring some of them in to be mentors as well. And, and partly my own take on it is that there, there are a lot of other incredibly successful programs for like teaching you how to start up a business or teaching you, you know, how to use tech in new ways to advance your creative ideas. And we're trying to think of what is particularly unique about what we could offer as an and that's why I personally, but we're debating this with a lot of people at GSAP, why I personally have shied away a little bit from saying like, oh, we need to offer um, this professional development, we need to teach our students how to write a business plan. There are a lot of other, if, if, a, if a project is coming out of GSAP and needs those things, I would probably recommend they maybe go somewhere else. But if they want to be engaged in this new hybrid between the academics and the profession, if they want to, you know, kind of give back to the students a little bit, if they want to be in this creative community where maybe there isn't already an existing business model for it, so it doesn't make sense to look at previous business plans. Mm -hmm. And she said, thank you for that. That's open for debate. <laughs> Some people have different ideas about it. But, you know, that's also part of it, is the members are helping each year to help push it a little more in one direction. Okay, so I think, um, you know, I want to invite everyone, who, anyone who stayed through all of these diverse presentations that your mind pushed in all these different ways and is still interested, um, thank you for staying. You know, please maybe come up and informally ask um, questions of anyone here. But, uh, thank you, thank you for staying. Um, and thank you everyone for the great talks. Thank you. Thank you.